All right. Uh, good evening, everyone, or uh, good afternoon, uh, or morning, wherever you may be. And thank you for uh, joining us for another session of the Virtual Global Spine Conference. Uh, we're happy to be presenting to you another uh, uh, case-based session. Uh, this one will be a little different. There'll, there'll maybe a few more informative educational slides, but we'll try to keep it as case-based as possible. We always try to aim for that. Um, I'm happy to be here uh, with you today with uh, uh, at least two of our faculty hosts, Dr. Wendy Gibbs, uh, neuroradiologist from Mayo Clinic, and Dr. Jonathan Rasuli, neurosurgeon from the Cleveland Clinic. And they will be helping me uh, moderate and uh, uh, moderate the session and take questions from the chat box. So uh, welcome everyone again and thank you for uh, joining us. And without further ado, I am going to uh, share my screen. All right, Wendy and Jonathan, does this look okay to everybody? Looks good. Okay, great. So welcome everyone. Uh, this discussion today is going to be uh, basically uh, revolving around uh, surgical approaches uh, as advertised on, on LinkedIn and Twitter uh, with an emphasis on the surgical uh, anatomy. And that's what we're going to do today. So it's going to be a little bit uh, heavier on the, uh, on the anatomy side, which is exactly uh, 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 what we want to do. So without further ado here, uh, obviously for some of you who, who, who know me, um, you know, one of my passions or, or some of my passions do involve surgical anatomy and, and training and education. That's why myself and several of our colleagues do this. Um, so these are a few papers back a few years ago that uh, where we took some cad uh, cadavers and basically did some uh, surgical anatomic work. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. But I'm hoping to share some of my, uh, some of my experience with, uh, uh, with you guys. So, you know, when it comes to, let's first start off with the basic approaches, if you will. And the basic approaches... Uh, in terms of, say, like a midline laminectomy approach, right? We all know that. We all know how to do that. Uh, posterior uh, midline approaches are very common. And uh, before we go too far, uh, I will ask, uh, uh, we'll see if the audience can put in their vote for what they think this is. And Dr. Gibbs and Rasuli can keep an eye on that. Uh, but uh, we'll go right to uh, Dr. Gibbs, our no radiologist. Wendy, I know you don't have a lot of slices or a lot of cuts, and that seems to be a problem here for us. But, but just off the back, what, what would you think this is most likely to be? Wendy, can you hear me? Yeah, he can't hear me though, huh? All right, sagittal post-contrast, T1 post-contrast bath saturated image. And let's see what level are you at? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, about T1. Sorry, if you already said this, I was distracted by the chat box. Um, T1, um, at the dorsal aspect of the cord, you have this really avidly enhancing mass. And it looks like it's extending along the surface of the cord, along the PF probably. Um, I can't really tell from this if the cord is expanded. It's probably not. It's probably only expanded to the degree that the mass is, you know, there. The cord itself around the mass is probably not as involved. Um, of, your, of your questions here, what, did you say what age this was or anything? Did you mean? Uh, I'd love to say it's a female, uh, you know, and her, her uh, kind of middle aged female, and this is, you know, like you said, an intramedullary kind of a PL lesion. Um, what, what, okay. would you, what would you Yeah, think? so, I mean, because that makes a little bit of a difference. The age would make a little bit of a difference, and gender maybe for some of your choices here. Usually, um, astrocytomas are larger and less well defined. A pendomoma would be in the center of the cord because it comes from the pendomal cells around the cord central canal. That's not what this is doing. Mangioblastoma, possibly. Um, I'd have to see it maybe on the axle, but maybe it's a good location. MS plaque, unlikely because of the avid enhancement, and it's very mass like. It's not, um, I haven't seen an MS plaque look quite that shape. Other, I would also include something like sarcoid. Um, those would be, that's how I would go down your list there. So, of those, I would say C or E. Yeah. Excellent. You, know, you nailed it. Well, oh, I'm sorry, was I supposed to guess? Oh, no, 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 you're absolutely right. So this is an angioblastoma. This was actually referred to us, they, they thought it was an intradural net from breast cancer. It turns out to be a hemangioblastoma. Here are the intraoperative uh, pictures. Uh, but again, this 
and not injury the axial, but this is a midline lesion. Um, you know, it, you don't need to take out facets or pedicles or drill, or drill down any of the stabilizing structures. So it's a midline laminectomy. That's something that we all do. It's, a, it's a, one of the most basic and straightforward uh, uh, cases. Uh, but now let's change it up a little bit. And this is not fair. I'm not going to ask you. This is a little bit challenging. But uh, this is a lesion. Jonathan, I may pick on you here. This is a, a lesion that, um, uh, that grew on subsequent imaging. Uh, the patient was having abdominal pain. It was an incidental finding. They, uh, they repeated the scan, you know, several months after it grew. They got a biopsy, and it came back as a schwannoma, okay? It came back as a schwannoma. Uh, the interesting thing is, um, you know, I think, I, sometimes I think like, uh, like our skull-based surgeon colleagues, our skull-based neurosurgeons, I try to think of lesions in terms of approaches. What approach is going to get me to this lesion? Uh, Jonathan, I'll ask this uh, to, to you here. What, what, how would you localize this lesion? You, I, I gave you a coronal and an axial. Where would you say this lesion is if you were describing it to your colleague or partner? Oh, you got to mute yourself. There we go. So I would say this is a lesion. Is that T12 or L1? I, I can't quite tell on that coronal. Is it 5, 4, 3? L1, yeah, I assume? Yeah, let's just say it's an L1. Yeah. Oh, so it's, it is a lesion that's anterolateral to the vertebral body of, at L1. It's on predominantly on the left side. Um, it does not seem to erode, maybe possibly erode just very, just the superficial cortical surface of the uh, anterior vertebral body of L1. Um, it's mostly retroperitoneal is how I, I would describe it. It looks, I would say it's most like a retroperitoneal mass, um, has some involvement uh, of the psoas, abuts the kidney, um, and it's just dorsal to the uh, great vessels. So if we're going to talk about approaches here, um, uh, you know, you the the base you, you're the arrow there basically shows, shows you exactly how your approach is going to be. So um, yeah. you can think of considering doing something like an like a lateral extracavitary approach, or um, uh, or, or doing just like a, 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 a kind of like a true lateral approach, uh, lateral retroperitoneal approach there. But you, you would need to get a, a access surgeon to do that. At least I, I, in my hands, I wouldn't feel comfortable um, doing that on my own. Okay, perfect, perfect. That, that was excellent. So the, the point of showing this case is, is sometimes we get these straightforward, you know, spinal canal lesions or, or you know, perivertebral lesions. But sometimes you have to think about, lo uh, about the location of where the lesion is. So... And, and I'll show some, some anatomic pictures here. So this really is, like you said, this is an infradiaphragmatic paracrural cargo. It's a paracrural region right below the diaphragm, like you said. And that is going to make a huge difference in, in how you approach this, right? This is not in the chest cavity, that you don't have to go transplural to do this. Right. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. So in order to better understand the surgical approach and to do it safely and efficiently, I'm, I'm not too shy to admit that often I do go back to the anatomy books or to the, to the spine model to see what's the safest way to approach this. So these are your attachments of the diaphragm to the spine for the surgeons here or, or the neuroradiologists or other specialists who, who study that area and look at that area frequently. It is a very complex and, and really beautiful relationship in my opinion uh, in terms of how the diaphragm uh, kind of attaches to the spinal column. So um, this was a few years back now. I, I'm sorry, this is a little bit self-serving. I'm going to show you some of my own studies, but they're good anatomic studies from back in the day. Um, but when we used to do a lot more anterior and lateral approaches, we still do many now, but we used, I would say we used to do a lot more. Um, I, I went to the lab and, and studied this a little bit. So. Pertaining to this case, once you take the lateral approach and you actually disattach the diaphragm or you mobilize the diaphragm, you can connect the pleural cavity or really the retropleural cavity, if you will, with the retroperitoneal cavity. And that's what's called the retropleural retrodiaphragmatic area. And the reason that's important is because that's where a lot of the fractures in, in, in spine surgery occur, right? A T12, L1 right at that junction where sometimes we need to go uh, anterior. 
So this is the lesion. Uh, Jonathan is absolutely correct. I did this with an axis surgeon, a mini open incision laterally, and this is the schwannoma uh, right here, superimposed on the anatomy, and it, it came out very nicely. But having an understanding of where it is in relationship to the, to the, to the pertinent structures is, in my opinion, very important. So back it up a little bit here in terms of just general approaches to the thoracic spine. I, I always look at it as, as a, almost like as a clock, right? We're used to the midline laminectomy approach. And the more lateral, lateral we need to get, now we're refining our approaches a little bit. Transpedicular, the costolateral lateral extracavitary approaches. And then finally, one of my favorite approaches, which again, you never know when you need it, we're doing less of it, but you never know when you need it, is the anterior, uh, anterior approach. Um, Maybe some folks in the chat box, some, some of the audience can, can kind of chime in. How many still do these? Um, you know, a lot of people still do these for trauma and tumor, but feel free to, to engage with us and, and tell us whether you still use this approach or not. Um, one important thing, some of us have trained to do these thoracotomies by ourselves, and, and some of us use access surgeons. I would say the standard more and more is to, is to utilize the expertise of, a, of, a, of an access surgeon. But remember, when you, as a spine surgeon, whether you're a neurosurgeon or orthopedic spine surgeon, you're the one that is in charge of the spinal anatomy and the spinal lesion. If you invite a thoracic surgeon to help you or a vascular surgeon to help you, they're going to do it the way they're used to doing it. But remember, the spine is more dorsal. That's why we no longer need these sharp bite incisions that are like super long and very invasive because we know that the spine is actually more dorsal. So this is a scout a CAT scan image that shows exactly, let's say you are targeting this lesion, you need probably at the most a seven to nine centimeter incision uh, right here. You really don't need those incisions that go all the way to the anterior belly. But in order to safely and confidently do that, you need to be comfortable with the anatomy in your target and then your access surgeon can help you and also be comfortable uh, with that as well. So just uh, that's just my take on inviting vascular and thoracic surgeons to help, which I do all the time, but you're still driving uh, the surgery, if you will. Again, a couple of studies I did back in the day. I would say with navigation, um, obviously it has made things a lot easier, but still, if you, if you don't know the anatomy, the navigation, uh, is, is may not bail you out. So for me, I still look when I'm doing say anterior approaches, I still look at the rib head in relationship to the aorta and in relationship to the canal. For those of us who do say the anterior approach, you know that one of the first things you do is, is amputate this rib head, but for the higher levels, this rib head, there's plenty of space between the rib head and the canal. As you go down T, T10, T11, T12, as you can see from this, uh, from this graph, the rib head may be just at the level of the canal. So you can't be too aggressive or otherwise your drill or osteotome will go right there. So again, you have to look at the preoperative imaging and understand the regional anatomy. Uh, again, these two papers, I'm sorry, this is a little, little self-serving, but these papers help me even today when I uh, look back and do some of these uh, anterior approaches. Always, always know the anatomy because that's what's going to get you out of your, out of trouble. Uh, I saw that one uh, that our uh, uh, co-host, uh, virtual spine co-host Koi joined us. Koi, are you there? Yep. Here it is. Koi, uh, welcome. The uh, so this is a not not a trick question, and actually just share with us what you would do. Uh, this is a young man with an L1 burst fracture uh, with an incomplete spinal cord injury. Um, Obviously, the treatment paradigms have changed. We know it's surgical, but the approaches perhaps have changed a little bit. How do you how do you manage these currently? You know, for this, I would probably do um, you know something like a T11 to L2 posterior fusion uh, with a decompression around the um, L1 level with uh, sort of um, ventral um, uh, compaction of the uh, fracture elements. Um, unless it's like a pretty significant, um, you know, vertebral plana, uh, tend to not do these uh, via corpectomy because I think if you just kind of get the 
spine realign and um, you know bone back where it should be it uh, results in generally good healing okay great I, I think I think that's actually very reasonable and I can tell you that nowadays say in the middle of the night if I get this I'm doing a posterior decompression and stabilization as you said uh, probably a few years back or, or in my younger days I would I would I would always approach these uh, anteriorly and that's just you know what I used to do um, and again this is an L1 you have to know the regional anatomy. You have to know that you have to disattach the arcuate ligaments, the medial and lateral arcuate ligaments, which is how the diaphragm attaches to L1 to be able to uh, safely do these constructs, which, um, you know, I've always, I've always thought that these were a little bit more elegant and, and provide better decompression. It turns out that the decompression is, is, a, is a little bit arbitrary, if you will, right? Nobody knows how much is enough in these cases. Um, but that was that was a burst fracture. Uh, it, I don't I don't know if John is able to has joined us yet. But uh, but um, this. Sorry to bother you. Or sorry to interrupt. Um, we have a one question from uh, Zach Silk. He said, "Could you elaborate on when and why you would decompress a burst fracture with a cord injury?" I guess that goes to Koi as well too. Uh, sure. So the so the question is, when do you decompress a burst? Why do you do it? I think in 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 the uh, in the presence of neurological deficits or incomplete spinal cord injury, uh, it's, it, you're probably mandated to decompress, whether you want to do it from the front or the back, not just stabilize. You actually do want to decompress the spinal elements in a spinal cord injury. At least that's been, the, that's been our training here for a long time. Koi, any thoughts or any, any uh, uh, contrary beliefs? No, completely agree. You know, in the case you presented with a neurologic deficit, incomplete injury, um, I think decompression's a must. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Ali, it's, um, what about, so I was wondering, I liked that question because what if there's not, um, cord injury, what if there's no neurologic deficit, wasn't this a big area of contention with the AO spine classification is, um, you know, bursts don't always need to be treated in the same way, depending on certain factors. Yes. The rectal lumbar junction. Yes, you're absolutely right, Wendy. The a burst fracture in a patient who's neurologically intact and without any significant kyphosis or uh, deformity, you can actually watch that without, uh, without having to operate. You can put them in a brace and that should be adequate. So that is, that is definitely a hot topic. The fracture dislocations are operative. The basic compression fractures are not. The ones in the middle, those burst fractures can go either way depending on multiple uh, factors, absolutely. Hey, and Ali, uh, maybe you and Jonathan could comment on when you um, would do fusion uh, versus when you would do sort of a perk stabilization with eventual hardware removal. Yeah, sure. Jonathan, what are your thoughts on, on, on what Koi just mentioned? When would you use perk screws for these? So uh, perk screws are, are generally are, are my go-to. I really like um, I, I really like that because you if if it, if and when at all possible. Um, if you're able to get a reduction um, or you don't need a significant reduction uh, and you can kind of just fuse them in situ with a decompression, then um, then I, I prefer to do this with perk screws. Um, sometimes though, it can be difficult um, in the middle of the night to just get all the stuff like get the C arm in there get the tag, get neuromonitor, and sometimes it can just be much faster to do this open. Um, in those cases, uh, you just, you just do it. You just get it done. Um, I, I think, I don't, I don't really think there's really one way that's better than the other in these cases. It's really just what are you more comfortable with? Yeah, great. Uh, I think that's a great answer. And we when definitely... I think you press a lot. I, I, I wouldn't, I don't, I wouldn't do uh, perk screws. Like in this case, I wouldn't do, I wouldn't perk this. And so again, just getting back to some of these approaches, this is a metastatic uh, lung, lung tumor, metastatic disease. There's so many different ways we, we were doing it. I think now there's a trend towards decompression separation surgery, probably for, for focal disease and, 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 and patients who don't have widespread disease. Some of us still will do a corpectomy, but I can tell you that's you know, uh, falling out of favor. You can see this. this was, we didn't use navigation here, but you can see how close the screws are to the canal. But a good knowledge of the anatomy with a good AP and lateral x-ray should, uh, uh, should get you out of trouble here. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Koi, Koi this, is, this is a lesion that was biopsied and it turned out to be chondrosarcoma. What, how would you uh, manage this? 
Yeah, I think for this uh, chondrosarcoma, you know, the goal here is a total end block resection. So um, I, I think actually um, navigation uh, can be pretty useful here. Um, kind of loading the boat, you know, perhaps including like a thoracic surgery colleague um, just to help around, you know, the pleural margin. But uh, for this, the goal is to um, uh, uh, take out the entire lesion, uh, preferably uh, and block. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. So this case and next, I'll show them to you. They're, they're similar. This is a chondrosarcoma. You want a total, complete on block resection if possible. And for me, I, I kind of use two approaches. I always start posterior first, separate it from the neural elements in the spinal cord, and then come laterally. And this is a theme that's going to recur here. Uh, it's a recurrent theme for the next few cases is I always want to control or protect the spinal elements, right? And the neural elements. That's what we do. We're spine surgeons, we're neurosurgeons. Uh, so for me, I always try to do that first. So I'm going to go posterior first, disarticulate it, do osteotomies if needed, and then come back laterally with, with, with a thoracic surgeon. Same concept here. We're going to go through a few cases quickly, but same concept here. This is a chordoma. This is a biopsy-proven chordoma. Again, I want to separate it from, I want to create a nice margin from where the neural, neural elements are and then come back with a thoracic surgeon who's going to, you know, do, 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 take it out for me from the side and he can worry about the, the, the descending uh, a thoracic aorta, if you will. Um, and so again, these are, this is the MRI, this is the coronal, this is an axial, and we were able to, this is the stage two. Stage one was already done posteriorly, and this is stage two where you can uh, deliver uh, the tumor. And I've gotten to do, a, I've gotten to, uh, 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 to, to kind of, that's been my approach for some of these paraspinal chest wall lesions that are abutting the, uh, uh, the spinal column. I'll do the stage one, I'll stabilize if needed, I'll do what I call hemiosteotomies, just take enough margin from the vertebral body uh, before, uh, uh, before we take it out from the side. Now, I, I've shown this before. Some of you have, have, have seen it. This is an MPNST. This is a, a, a malignant nerve sheath tumor. Um, same, same exact principle. You can see here on the axial, I don't know if you can see my arrow or not, but this is where the spinal cord is, and this is all tumor. My job is to make sure that to do an effective surgery, but also to do a safe surgery. So I'm going posteriorly. I'm making sure that I control the neural elements. I control the spinal uh, cord and then come back laterally for, uh, for a resection of this lesion. This is done with a thoracic surgeon and, and this big piece comes out. That's great. But the most important thing is decompressing the spinal canal and, and the spinal cord. And we had to reconstruct this, uh, of course. Uh, now, this gets a little bit interesting. This is a chondrosarcoma. Uh, this is a chondrosarcoma at T2, I believe. This was at the T2 level. This patient had an emergent laminectomy decompression elsewhere for spinal cord compression. And the pathology came back as a chondrosarcoma. He came back to me. Um, I wanted to do a little bit of more formal decompression uh, and stabilization, and this is the uh, th these are the uh, this is the case that I had shown on, on online um, where I have no problem for, for T2. I have no or below. I have no problem in in uh, uh, asking uh, one of our uh, cardi cardiac surgeons to help with a sternotomy. Uh, I did a few sternotomies when I was a fellow. I liked them for if you wanted to try to do an on block resection or. To, go, to, to basically approach the, the, low, the high thoracic vertebra, T2, T3. T4 is like the limit. You really can't go be below T4 on that. And, and again, I, I found it, it, there's very few things that I do here that are complicated that I didn't either look at the anatomy first or I didn't actually do the cadaveric work myself just so I can learn from it. And so there are very important structures here uh, relating to the uh, brachiocephalic veins, uh, the, the aortic arch, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to help you do these safely. So knowing the surgical anatomy is very important. Don't just rely on your axis surgeon because they'll get you there. But in the end, it's really your responsibility to be able uh, to do these surgeries safely. And this was the final construct. We could have done this all posteriorly. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I wanted a little bit more a decompression and a, and a more solid stabilization ventrally. 
to support the anterior column. And that's why I decided to go ventral. And, and this, this gentleman is at least three years out and, and he's been doing really, really well. So a lot of people think the anterior approach is morbid and it is morbid. Uh, but, you know, when, I think when done effectively for the right indication, patients tend to tolerate it uh, quite well. Okay, so that was my spiel on the thoracic approaches, if you will. And now we'll just kind of change it up a little bit. Uh, Jonathan, this gentleman here, this young man in his early 20s, uh, had a terrible uh, car crash and suffered this with an incomplete uh, spinal cord, basically a cauda quina. He came in with a cauda quina syndrome. And this is the axial at L5, and this is the fracture at L5, and he also had some, uh, an L3 fracture here. What are your thoughts? And th this guy's gonna come in in the middle of the night, um, incomplete, you know, can't move his feet, has a little bit of iliopsoas moving, you know, he's got a Foley in. What, what are you gonna do? And I'll throw this also back to the, uh, to the audience and the participants. What, what would people do here? Jonathan, your thoughts? Yeah, so this is a, this is a, pretty complicated injury. Um, at uh, L5, it looks like it's a sagittal split fracture with uh, retropulsion of the fragments into the canal. I mean, it's essentially complete obliteration of the canal. Um, he is, he does have um, evidence of either nerve root or spinal cord injury. Um, and I'm, what's going on at L3, I don't know if that's related to his L5 fracture. It might be like a, a AO spine type B fracture, like a like almost like a, a chance type, or that just could be just some non-structural spinous process fracture. It's hard to tell um, mm -hmm. without getting an MRI to really know if the uh, posterior ligamentous complex is intact. Um, I'm wondering if he, did this patient get an MRI before surgery or? Uh, he, he did not get an MRI. So in the middle of the night, I mean, this, these sagittal, sagittal split type fractures are unique in that they tend to um, require a corpectomy. They usually don't heal well on their own, unlike the oblique type fractures. So um, again, in the middle of the night, um, you know, you're talking about a big surgery. If you're going to do it, you can do this all posteriorly. You, I mean, you can, you can do a laminectomy, take out all those fragments, do a, put a corpectomy cage in there um, and, and then instrument him likely two up, two down, maybe even, maybe even a little higher because of that fracture at L3. Um, maybe you go a couple of levels higher than that. Um, alternatively, you could stage this. Um, you could just decompress him, throw in some screws and then bring, you know, let him cool down and bring him back and do the corpectomy. Um, later on. It's going to be important with your corpectomy in that you don't want to fuse this guy flat. He's young. He's going to end up having so many problems down the road if this guy is flat. So you really want to try to restore his lordosis or recreate his lordosis with that, um, with the, with the corpectomy. So just something to keep in mind. Yeah. Great, great thoughts. And, and, you know, since I have you on that. Uh, back. If he's going to get, or, or, or 360, like, uh, just, he's going to need 360. Not, not hey, just. Ali, can I ask you a question about this? Because it's related to how just how Rosili just answered, and I liked actually the second thing you said about doing the first, doing it in stages because I think you need more information than you got here. This that the spinous process fracture. I don't know how that could possibly happen without ligamentous injury higher up. Right, right. That's what I was and thinking. So yeah, yeah so you sure. might definitely go higher than you would think if you knew what was going on there. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That, that, that's a great point. That's absolutely a great point because you're right. I mean, you, you may have to go higher. I think at the time of doing this, uh, when this young man came in kind of with acute deficits and I looked at the spinous process, I knew we had to include that. I wasn't too worried about L2-3 because I didn't see any splaying. I didn't see any listhesis there, uh, but you're right. Um, I think an MRI would be helpful to see what's going on here. Now, Jonathan, I'm going to put you on the spot here. You do this in the middle of the night. You do a laminectomy fusion, and you get a ton of uh, CSF here. Uh, when you do the laminectomy, what are you going to do? Yeah, so that's that's one of the big problems with um, with this because you're almost guaranteed to get a CSF. I mean, just look at those fragments. It, I mean, the, the fecal sac is totally obliterated. So your choices are um, once you kind of get the fragments out and you get control over it, you can leave a lumbar drain in. You can, um, you can try to, uh, what, we, what we have done is we basically take a big piece of Duragen and we try to um, isolate, we try to find areas, we decompress uh, cranially and we decompress caudally until we see normal dura. And we take a p big piece of Duragen that essentially spans the width of that and we wrap it around, like a, if you can imagine like a burrito around, mm -hmm. the, um, around the area that's uh, essentially where you have all the, the dural tears. Um, it can work 
to somewhat mitigate CSF, but it's not, a, it's not, nothing is going to be hundred percent effective. Um, you can also, in, you know, include adjuncts such as surgical glue. Um, and then ultimately the most important thing is going to be your fascial closure. So these are all, these are all yeah. things. Great, great points. And, and uh, the, the point to, to, to make here and, 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 a few, a few folks in the chat box already did, which is you, you, you're going to probably see CSF there and just have to be able to manage it, know what to do. And, and, and for me, just like you said, a very, you know, a nice complex multilayer closure, preferably lumbar drain, um, you know, post-op, keep a close eye on him. I mean, these patients may need shunts if they keep uh, draining. You know, you can always put a lumbar, lumbar perineal shunt. Luckily, this guy did not need it. He had a CSF leak, but he did not need a shunt. So I, 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 I did what you, what you recommended, one of, one of the options, which is acutely at night to decompress posteriorly an instrument and then bring back uh, for a stage two, uh, uh, for a stage two uh, in, in the anterior, anteriorly. And I, I, I put this for the, for the audience here, but I think, I feel like we already answered it. I don't know what most people would do, uh, but I can tell you, I did D, I did Posterior first, I sat on him for a few days and then did anterior. And I can tell you this, this kid got significantly better after three months. It took him three months, but he did, he did really, really well. But, it, but, but you know, doing an L5 corpectomy is nothing to be, you know, it, it's not that simple. Right. Uh, we always do ALIPS. We do L5, S1, ALIPS, L4, 5. But that's because we're able to mobilize the, the vessels with the help of vascular surgery above and below. So you need to look at the anatomy a little bit closer here. You need to understand where the, uh, the where the veins and where, where the arteries are, so you can so you can safely do this. And that's exactly what I did. This is an old case. I've shown it before, but I did posterior first. I did include L3 just because I didn't like the fracture up there, and I needed extra stabilization. And then I went back from the front uh, several days later. Could you do this all from the back? Yes, but again. Uh, I've, I've already shared with you my bias towards liking some of these ventral uh, and anterior approaches for structural uh, support. Hey, Ali, could you talk about the choice of back front, uh, sorry, back first versus front first? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. So, so why go to the back first? Number one, in the middle of the night, I need to do something quick. I need to do it alone. I know how to go in posteriorly, right? Multi-level decompression, I can do that posteriorly. I can do stabilization. I, I can do all of that, give him time. And then once he cools off a little bit, because you know this is going to be a bloody mess here, these acute cubital body fractures, give him a couple of days to take it easy and, and cool off will make a second stage a lot easier. Uh, that's just my personal opinion. I think that you could make an argument to also do this anteriorly first. I have no problem with that. Um, my, my, my preference is always do posterior first in general just easier for me, regardless of the time of the night or day. Um, uh, Koi, you can hear, hear us, right? Yes, absolutely. Great. So this is a patient with osteomyelitis. I'm, I'm sorry that I'm just showing you the uh, one, one cut here. Uh, comes in, let's say middle-aged male, comes in with significant myelopathy, lower extremity weakness, and has this, uh, and has this lesion. Um, Again, I'm sorry I'm not giving you a lot of information here, but, but just in general, what, does, what are the surgical approaches that you would employ here? And sorry, you said which level is that? I'm at thoracic. Let's just say it's T7, T8. Yeah, you know, so I think for um, osteomyelitis, um, uh, you know, obviously the, 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 the goal here is to decompress the spinal cord. Um, and so um, uh, generally, uh, I think useful here would be a CT scan just to really understand the bone quality. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think uh, if you sort of instrument this above and below, get the patient on, on appropriate antibiotics, uh, oftentimes if there's sufficient sort of bone stock there, um, that'll sort of uh, ankylose on its own. Now, if it looks like mush on the CT, then you're talking about sort of a bigger um, uh, uh, sort of a, a corpectomy approach. Um, uh, if this is mid-thoracic, you know, sacrificing those nerve roots come at uh, pretty uh, little consequence. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd uh, I would tend to do this posteriorly rather than through uh, than via thoracotomy. Got it. Got uh, it. Although both are options. Yep. Yeah. But Wendy, can, again, sorry to put you on the spot, Wendy. I know I don't. I usually don't show a lot of these images, uh, but but we were we we had a session in which we were trying we were talking about the difference between an epidural abscess and a phlegmon. So oh, yeah. this 
with this T1 with contrast, would you say that this is phlegmon or abscess, or can you tell? Well, just from this one image, I don't see any central non-enhancement, so that would be phlegmon. You have to have central non-enhancement, like a real abscess, to call it an abscess. But um, uh, for the degree of compression, no. I mean, that kind of, that's what I've heard is the difference between conservative and surgical, but that degree of compression, I don't know that it matters. That is a lot for just a big phlegmon to be uh, yeah. compressed in the thoracic cord, so. Yeah. And I might have more examples of that for you later. If oh, get all right, let's get to it. Uh, so this, you're right, this was a phlegmon, it was not an abscess, but given the degree of cord compression, um, you know, we, we decided to intervene surgically and, and, and Corey's absolutely right. I think posterior is pretty straightforward. On the axial, I would show you that this is a, you know, very central. So you really have to do some transpedicular work in order to safely go around the spinal cord. To mitigate against that, again, I just kind of left that all alone completely and did two stage, did posterior with decompression infusion, multi-level fusion, and then I came lateral to just kind of clean all of that up. Um, I, I think you can do all of this posteriorly. I just think you can be a little bit more definitive when you approach it ventrally. But again, that's just a, a preference uh, and a bias. Uh, this case should have been and could have been a lot bigger, of course, but with multi-level fixation above and below, this, this is less likely to, to subside. Uh, but the only thing I would not do here is a midline laminectomy because I think that's dangerous. You've got to go either poster lateral into one of your poster lateral approaches like uh, the transpedicular costos or come from the front. But you can't just do a midline laminectomy and reach around the cord. That's how you'll get in trouble with either this or with the calcified discs as, as we all know. Um, now for some of the uh, MIS surgeons out there, which uh, I wouldn't say I'm one of them, but I do, I, I, I call myself a hybrid surgeon. I do some MIS, but uh, for others, I just wanted to show this case because I really don't necessarily think that there are open, complex, and MIS surgeons. I think there are simple pathologies and complex pathologies, and you can either treat them open traditional fashion or MIS fashion. So not to belabor that point, uh, Jonathan, take a look at this. This, this is a guy who came in with significant lower extremity weakness, chronic, uh, multiple previous surgeries. I mean, this is just absolutely terrible, right? Infection, osteodiscitis, just nastiness. What are you gonna do here? I'm gonna, you, uh, I'm gonna find, <laughs> find, out the, find out who the original surgeon was and, <laughs> and send him right back. <laughs> I'll, I'll send him over to Phoenix for you. No, uh, this, so this is a disaster. So um, this is this is a disaster. So th this yeah. this is uh this is one of these cases. You definitely um, okay. So the first thing I want to know is um, this, is this is there a bug? Do we know what the um what is causing this and how long that patient has been on antibiotics? I want to know. I want to get plastic surgery on board in advance. I want them to you know take a look at the wound, see what they think, um, whether. What, whether um, this needs to be, some, one of the, sometimes you need to do um, a stage approach where and you, you go in, you wash everything out, put a wound back, let them sit, bring them back, debride more, wound back, you know, let them sit, bring them back, debride more, wound back. But these are decisions that are usually made between us and plastic surgery. I see how sick this guy is. Can he tolerate a big surgery? Um, assuming he can, this is, um, this is a very difficult case because you can see that uh, his, he has essentially no anterior column there. It's, it's just gone. And as Koi said, it's mush. Um, posteriorly, uh, it's kind of hard to tell, but he's had prior surgeries there before. There's tons of scar tissue. Uh, everything there is significantly stenosed and compressed. He probably has some, I'm assuming he has a, like a big sacral decubitus ulcer there or something just horrible. Yeah, not yet. Not yet. But... But, but you have to decompress and stabilize this guy, right? I mean, he's yes, got absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> but the reason I'm showing this case is, is just to kind of, you know, share what, what, what I think is this is why it's important and for the trainees and the students that are with us. It's, it, that's why it's important to have different tools in your toolbox. It's not always about go big or go home. It's not always right. about let's, let's do a front L4, L5 propectomy here. I would probably never do that in the, in the setting of an infection, to be honest with you. Unless you really hate your vascular surgeon, don't do that to them, you know? Yeah. So this is where I kind of use my MIS skill set. I said, you know what, let me perk this guy. Let me stabilize him. 
And then let me use, I do MIS TLIPs all the time. Let me use an MIS TLIP approach to debrief that area, clean out the pus and see what happens. I don't think he would have tolerated a big incision. Um, so, you know, I did, you know, multiple stab incisions for the perk screws. This is where we did the TLIP style debridement, if you, if you will. And, and a few other, and a few people like Mike Wang uh, and others have, have, uh, um, have described the, the kind of the perk iliac screw fixation. So all of this was done completely percutaneously. And this was his three months post-op. I did not do a formal debris, uh, decompression. I, not, I did not do a laminectomy. Now, is this guy going to fuse? Is he going to fail here above? I don't know, but I'm happy with this result at three months. Of course, the guy was lost to follow up. This was done many years ago, but it, it's okay to put different hats on and, and use different skill sets. So this was a completely MIS case, if you will, that, that I think has an acceptable result for, for, for what could have uh, the alternative, if you will. Uh, do you think this was more of a Charcot joint, or do you think this was a uh, this is this is like just a real like chronic uh, osteomyelitis? I think this was osteodiscitis. We had a lot of pus come out when we put that uh, that big Q red there to debride that area. We actually suctioned out prelent material from that through that T lip incision, believe it or not. So it's good to use it's good to use kind of different skill sets. Um, so again, this is a big alley. Yeah. Can you comment on uh, your decision to not instrument S1 there? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. It's just easier. It's easier sometimes to connect the rod percutaneously to the iliac and, and, and bypass the sacrum. And I also thought that the, you know, I also thought I wanted to be as far away from this area as possible. But the honest answer is just easier to connect the rods. Sometimes you either have to leave the S1 screws proud or you have to put a sharp bend in the rod to connect them. So just for practical ease, that's all. Uh, so again, this is just a, a personal take on it. I don't think there's a complex spine surgeon at NMIS. I think you can use either to treat complex pathologies, but that's a whole different lecture. I'm gonna skip over the complications. I know everybody wants to see them because we're going to have some nice uh, flip cases from Dr. Gibbs, uh, but I'll, maybe we'll show this some other time. But just in the last minute or so, I, I'm, you know, I'd like to share with you what my personal keys to safe complex spine uh, are. Number one is, um, you know, obviously treat the patient, not the x-ray. And I can't overemphasize going to the anatomy lab. You know, all of us have access to cadaveric uh, courses, or at least we used to, where we travel to these sponsored workshops. I always like to spend an extra few minutes, you know, after everybody's done to, to try something or do something that I, I really always wanted to do, but not in patients. Um, this is a big one right here know what can get you in trouble. So every time I look at difficult cases, I'm like, what's gonna get me in trouble? Is it the vertebral artery? Is it the spinal cord that's severely compressed? Is it the iliac vessels? Always know what can get you uh, uh, in trouble. A um, Couple of other pointers. Um, I, you know, I do a lot of cognitive rehearsals. I kind of think about the surgery like a million times before the operation, I'm, I know we all do, uh, but sometimes that helps. And Oh, sorry about that. And make sure you have different skill sets because you never know where you're going to use them. So this patient, you know, we, we did one pedicle screw, one translanner screw, and one par screw in the same patient. This was C2. If you know just one, if you just know how to do a pedicle screw and the patient doesn't have a pedicle at C2, you're not going to be able to, 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 to fixate there. It's always good to have a uh, multiple you know, with or without navigation to have multiple skill sets so you can employ for, for each patient. Um, and of course, like I said, you know, I love the lab and I, I really encourage people to look at the, the, anatomy, uh, the anatomy very closely. And I'm gonna end it here. I rushed the last few minutes because I really wanna get to some of the flip cases uh, and I hope you guys in, in enjoyed some of those. Uh, some of those. So uh, Wendy, without further ado, we'll go to you for some cases and. I'll take some comments or questions from Jonathan or um, or Poi as we do that. That was awesome, Ali. Really fast. Really, really fast. Go ahead, though, Jonathan. Ask your questions. No, I was going to just say that was that was really really good. I really enjoyed that. That was that was nice. Uh, really not very well ordered. Right, I rushed the end there, but thought we we it's good to get to these cases. This is what this is all yep. about. So. Anything else from the audience before I start, or Jonathan? Uh, 
Ali, do you, do you um, use S2AIs or Iliac screws routinely? Um, I have shifted towards S2, A, S2 ALR Iliac screws. S2 AI screws with, with navigation, I love them. Easier to connect. I don't have to do all the muscle dissection. Um, I've almost exclusively gone to S2 ALR, uh, ALR Iliac screws. Same. Okay, anything else? Yeah, that's it. All right, My, turn. For us. My turn. So these are selfish questions because I always like to learn from you all. When things come up and I don't have anybody to ask, I kind of remember. And so now I have all of these nice surgeons to ask my questions. Hopefully they'll be interesting to you though. So um, where's Koi? Koi, come take my case. Can Koi take it? I'm here. I'm here. Don't worry. <laughs> you can pick on him. Koi, well, take this case. So the uh, the um, it's all today except for the one picture that's labeled three months ago. You want any help, or do you want to kind of give me a summary here? Oh, I can uh, maybe try to talk through it. So, um, uh, so uh, left upper, we've got a, a T1. Uh, looks like uh, without contrast, you see some uh, marrow changes in both um, you know L2 and L3. Uh, compared to three months ago, um, L2, um, you know, also had some uh, signal involvement there. It looks like uh, there's further compression. <laughs> Sorry, my baby's chiming in. Uh, further, further compression of L2, uh, further progression of the marrow change in L3. Um, I, I guess I would interpret the, uh, uh, the T2 similar. And then on the contrast enhancement, it looks like it lights up with, um, uh, uh, with contrast. Both of those levels do. Um, on the axials, I don't know that that adds anything to, to what I just said. So, you know, I think- so let me, I'll uh, give I, you some history too, because that'll help. I should have done that, sorry. This is a 40 year old guy who had, okay, so he's had back pain since uh, last spring. So that three months ago was his first MRI, which had also been delayed, because he didn't come in for anything or to the doctor. And um, so 40 year old, and you described it very well. I think people in the audience know that there is um, discitis osteomyelitis here. That's what it looks like, right? But what's I don't think so, no. I oh, think you know? No, I think with the preservation of the disc space, that uh -huh. actually argues yeah. against it. Um, okay. So I would be uh, worried about an underlying you know, oncologic process here, perhaps. Interesting, yes. nice. Okay, but it's not. So he, that is very good though, because that's what no, I said. I don't believe you, I don't believe you. <laughs> no, that's exactly what I said to the, to the infectious disease doctor when I talked to him. So I said, are you sure this isn't cancer? And he said, yes, he's been at, worked up extensive. There is no cancer. So the interesting thing about this, so he had, um, he's had chronic back pain. Can you see my mouse or no? Yes. Okay. He has new acute back pain now, and this is this pathologic fracture that's developed in L2, in L2. so severe pain. ID doc wants to know what's the progression, um, how can we treat this, kyphoplasty, which I said no because he's infected. Also, he has ridiculous symptoms on the right here, and you can see why, because where the nerve roots are coming out at these levels, there's a lot of this inflammatory stuff, so that's affecting his nerves coming out. So he was tested extensively the first time. He got CT guided biopsy, got open surgical biopsy, no bug, nothing. He's been treated, well, so uh, as Koi said, Normal disc, this is not pyogenic osteomyelitis. We would think something atypical granulomatous. Um, in Phoenix, you usually think coxy, but negative for coxy, negative for anything else. He's not febrile. Um, I believe his ESR and CRP are only mildly elevated. So it doesn't even seem like infection. Everything's been ruled out. He had a quantifier on gold, which was negative. So ID comes to me and says, what do we do? And I said, you know, we can biopsy again. You've had an open biopsy. I doubt I'm going to do better than that, although it's been a little bit of time. So my suggestion was go see neurosurgery because you've got this progressive collapse and severe pain right here. We're not going to do kyphoplasty cement augmentation when that's infected. So I'm sending them to you, one of you. Ali, Jonathan. Yeah. I, console, I from ID. Well, when everything else fails, it's either sarcoid or syphilis, right, from med school? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, what do you do? So we don't have a, I mean, we don't have a bug. I can biopsy it again, but we don't have a bug. We have progressive deformity. We have severe pain from that fracture. They're coming to you to ask what they should do. Does nobody have an answer for them? 
I, I really want to know what it is. And um, if you want to, um, sorry, quiet, I didn't mean to butt in. Um, does the pa- I would really want to also get a standing x-ray just to see what this patient looks like. Can, can a patient stand? You know, they can stand. I don't know that I have an x-ray, but I have CT. That tells you so much about, uh, yeah, but it's, it's not uh, weight bearing. It just, just standing. No, but it shows, quite, it shows quite that it's infection and not cancer, but yeah. This is this is infection with primitive changes in the bone. Was the um, was the right. done um, at your institution or was it done somewhere else and just being reported as uh, being negative? The, did you say the biopsy? It was somewhere else, so of course. I would I, I, would if I do it. It'll be I'll get the bug, but but what if I don't? <laughs> uh, I would at least attempt a biopsy before I would um, think about doing anything neurosurgical there, or, or like uh, if, if you're leaning towards fixating this guy, which I don't think he needs. I really want to know what you're dealing with first, you know? Okay, so he's in severe pain from this fracture, though, so you guys wouldn't do anything for that. Why, why yeah. is it, you know, there, there are ways and, of- And, and collapsed. This has collapsed about 30% from that three months uh, ago. Collapsed the, fracture. The, posterior attack, the posterior ligamentous complex, and the, the best way to know is to really get an uh, axial weight-bearing uh, x-ray and see if he starts kyphosing or you see something. Sometimes you, you gain a lot of information just from that uh, imaging that you're not going to get on- um, MRI and CT. I would really want to see that before I would um, consider doing anything else. And and repeating the biopsy because that that's that's very important. Because right now, is he on antibiotics? Like what? What if they think it's infection? He's, he's they, been treated with antibiotics. He's been treated with antifungals for coxy nothing and has helped. He's still progressing. Wendy, this is the same. This is the same case. The this CT is, and the MRI. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. And and by the way, this last picture over here in the corner. This is also the key for Koi as to why this is infection and not um, cancer. So it's spreading under the anterior longitudinal ligament. Yeah. You see the soft tissue and it's destroying yeah. the anterior part. To me, for all the world, this looks like TB. His quantiferon gold was negative. I don't know what that means. What gets my attention is that top left panel on my screen yeah. where um, the, right, the, you know, the perivertebral tissue is so inflamed and so thickened as compared, you know, there's asymmetry there and, you know, very few things that cause that that's not an infection. So yep. um, that's, that's what I would think. Okay, so you all are not, you're not gonna help this poor guy. You're just asking for more information. So I'll try, but poor guy, I guess you won't. Wait, so do we, have a, do we have a confirmed diagnosis of TB? No, that's what I'm saying. Quantiferon gold was negative. By imaging, this is classic, but. So just give the dude like a PPD, right? Does that work better than quantiferon gold? I don't know the answer. I'm a radiologist. It's been five years. <laughs> yeah, I would. I would not not right. 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 Because that could be a false negative if he has something that's underlying. Okay, so even if it's TB, then will you do something or no? I, w- I would just treat him. Uh, I, w- I would get a standing upright x ray, and if that looks okay, okay. I would treat him with uh, the medication. Very unsatisfying. Okay, I'm going on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's another case. This is a woman who's 80 years old. Again, this is three months. So three months ago, she got this mild compression fracture here at four. She continues to progress. So now it's almost a vertebra plane. And this was sent to me, evaluation for, again, cement augmentation. Um, so she has, you know, the usual things. She has osteoporosis. She doesn't want to take osteoporosis medications. Her fracture right here has retropulsion into the canal. It also, if you look down on the bottom here, involves the um, lamina. And she's got about, I don't know, a couple millimeters of residual canal there. She's not severely symptomatic, but she is, has to be on opioids. Maybe that is severe. I can give you maybe an MR, let me see. There's your MR. Mm. It doesn't wanna take any kind of osteoporosis medicine. 80. What would you do? Are these, are these not good questions? Are they? You well, all don't like my cases. Her, uh, I think it depends on her symptoms, Wendy. If, yeah. I mean, if she's coming with a lot of just back pain, like just purely back pain, right. then she we has have ridiculous pain too. Hmm? Managed with opioids, she's, she's got ridiculous pain too. Yeah. Uh, if it's mostly ridiculous pain, I have no problem doing a focal decompression. Once you start putting screws and rods in this lady who's yep. osteoporotic, forget mm-hmm. you've opened a can of worms there. So That's you do absolutely nothing for the, or, or a very minimal decompressive surgery to, to help her with her leg pain, but tell her it's not going to help her back pain. 
That, that's what I would do. Anything to add there, Koi? Koi or baby Koi? <laughs> Actually, I don't want to know why it's medication. It, it, it's odd. I've never heard of really that before. I, that, that needs to be investigated and figure out why that's the case. Because it's like you're just. Oh, it's common because people, I mean, it's people are scared to death of that now. It causes side yeah. effects and they think right. they're going to get other yeah. kinds of fractures. So people Correct. are more worried about it than they should be. But that, that usually represents a failure of the doctor patient relationship more than anything that, you know, the patient doesn't know. You know, okay. like we're just reading what they say on TV and they're relying on the doctor to come and advise them in a way. And if the patient is so adamantly refusing, it generally means that the, the physician did not adequately or properly explain to them the risks and the benefits and the reasons why they should take that medication. Because you can do whatever you want here, but if the patient's, if the patient's bone quality is just awful, it, you're, just, you're not going to get anywhere here. Yeah. Koi, cool. anything there before I go on? Okay. Yeah, I like that. That's a good answer. Okay. This one, another 40 year old who had had, I'm sorry, I don't have both pictures here. I only have her picture of after she fractured. So proximal junctional failure, right? Is that, am I saying that correctly? So she had this compression fracture at the top of her construct. Um, so I'll ask you what you do. I will add that when they went in there, she had pus coming out and it was um, candida. So now what do you do? I'll, I'll leave this to the other guys. I'm sure they're, they're excited to jump on to this case, but I'm just going to say one thing. From the three cases that you showed, Wendy, this is the easiest one. This is the <laughs> easiest one the three cases that you've shown. I'll let the guys play with, with this. Yeah. So she has a, she has a uh, you know, just a major um, – long construct um what is that like a t i'm assuming it's what, like a t10 or t9 to pelvis um with l45 l5 s1 a lift um <clears throat> probably done for for flat back i don't know if she had an osteotomy there and she's developed it looks like a, a proximal junction proximal junctional failure um at the top of her construct um she you said it was canada it was it was due to infection yeah okay um, well, there's infection there, and so we think. I don't know. Yeah, close to, I'd say she's close to like you know 30 to 40 degrees of, of kyphosis over there, and that's clearly um, unstable. I, I'd want to get a CAT scan b before I would do surgery, but uh, she needs to be extended up uh, superiorly, probably to like T4. Probably has horrible bone quality too. It looks like that on the X-ray. I'll modify that plan a little bit. You know, first of all, you know, I think uh, here this happened because of overcorrection, right? You know, there's yeah, like, oh yeah, sure. Over a lordotic uh, lumbar spine there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think for this type of patient, if she uh, is neurologically intact, you can absolutely um, get her treated uh, first for her Canada for her osteoporosis prior to extending her up, which would be my option. You know, if she's uh, if she has a neural deficit, then your hand is forced to to act sooner. But um, uh, other than sort of getting the other issues treated first, I agree with Jonathan. Okay. Yeah, and that was the key for me to this case was, would that unusual type of infection make a difference? So, because that is harder to treat and longer to treat, I think, than most. All right, good. Should I go on? Ali, did you have anything add there before I go on? Okay. All right. This goes to a Twitter discussion we had recently. So, I think at least Ali knows what this is. Um, you, and so this is not any kind of, uh, you know, what kind of instrumentation would you put in? This is, would you treat and how? Do you want me to just do the case myself or? Yeah, sure. Go for okay, it. sagittal, unless anybody thinks they, they know what it is. It looks like epidural lipomatosis, if I just had to kind of shoot yeah. it. Yeah, very nice. So they have... Um, they have a normal alignment. They don't have much degeneration. They don't have any big disc bulges. And yet on the sagittal T1, you can see how narrow their fecal sac is here, especially at the bottom. They don't even have congenital stenosis. So all this on the sagittal T1, this white stuff in the back is all epidural fat. So T1 hyper intense, just like the sub-Q fat, T2 hyper intense. On stir, it, the signal drops out. Somebody asked about stir earlier on the chat. Just like sub-Q. We drop out the fat. So we know this is all fat. It's not an abscess. It's not hemorrhage. It's not anything else. So severely symptomatic. What can you operate on these? This was kind of a discussion, which I thought was interesting. I'd like to hear everybody's opinions. When do you do surgery on these cases? What was the main um, 
what chief complaint was it um neurogenic claudication or was it back, mechanical back pain or what, what was the what was the issue i i boy i'm not sure i think it was claudication that sounds okay yeah yeah i think these can absolutely be treated um surgically now obviously mm -hmm. first uh if possible uh you'd want the patient to stop their steroids or lose weight or what have you but um, absolutely have uh, offered minimally invasive decompressive procedures uh, for patients who have claudication and severe stenosis due to lipomatosis. Ali, is it that easy? Yeah, I, actually, I was just typing in the chat box my opinion. Um, I, I think those are tough cases. I, I, you know, patients are on steroids and they can stop them. That would be great. If they can lose weight, that would be great. But unless they have significant neurogenic claudication or deficits, I try not to pull the trigger on them. Obviously, if somebody has true deficits, you're kind of obligated to decompress. Um, I, call it, I call this a spinal liposuction. That's really what it is. It's you do the laminectomy and you suck out the, the, the adipose tissue. The dura, and this is from personal experience and it's published, the dura is very thin. It's, you know, high chance of CSF leak. Yeah. Uh, so I've, you know, I've done, I don't know why, I've done a lot of these. Uh, I would say s some patients get better, most probably don't. Um, so I'd rather not pull the trigger on these surgically unless they are showing uh, true uh, neurological deficits. That's just a personal opinion. Okay. Anything to add there, Rizuli? No, I, spot on. I agree with Ali. Okay. Let me see if that might. Oh, yeah, that was the imaging. Oh, last case, rheumatoid arthritis. <laughs> you gonna help this poor lady? Oh my God. <gasps> this one is, this one's a Rizzoli Friday night special. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Wow, wow, wow. So That's poor bone quality, obviously, and she, she can't see her grandkids. Well, maybe she can see her grandkids because they're kind of on the floor, but can you help her? What would you do? Is that too complicated for the last case? That's crazy. Uh, I think that means, that means an entire, you know, actually. I, I, we just the whole. Actually, oh, with my case. Case, <laughs> this may be a very good case flip case for next week's session because it, it's kind of, you know, close to what we're going to talk about. What do you think? Should we save it? I think so. Because I, yeah, think, I think, think so. Good. We're going to go over time. Yeah. This but is going to need like a back front, back front, back front, back front, you know, one of those kind of things. <laughs> this is a great case to talk about. Make sure you put it on. She can absolutely be fixed. All right. Yeah. It that's can be fixed right. somehow. Back front, back front, back front, back front, back. One of those kind of things. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Great. All right. Great. I'm stopping my screen here. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Wendy, Jonathan, uh, Coy, and all of the participants. It's, uh, it's absolutely a, a pleasure to do these with everyone. Uh, you know, this, the summer is, uh, I guess in some parts are winding down and uh, we're still going to be uh, hopefully doing a lot of these uh, sessions and changing things up a little bit. Um, but uh, join us again next Thursday. I'm going to uh, uh, let Dr. Gibbs talk about that because she is in charge of next week. But I want to thank everyone for being here today. Stay safe and uh, keep an eye out uh, for our uh, flyers and advertisements as, uh, as we go here over the next few weeks. So Wendy, what's in store for uh, next week? Yeah, so next week, um, craniocervical junction complex cases like we just saw with Dr. Baj and Nader. The, I use the last name I can't pronounce. How do you pronounce Nader's last name? Yeah, Dr. Dahdala. Dahdala and myself. And, and <laughs> I, I thought I'd better not say it wrong it's from Northwestern. We're so glad to have him back. He's been on before and he's fantastic. So we'll have some more good cases. Five o'clock. Yeah, everybody right here. Next That's week, it. Next week, cranial cervical cases. Thank you, everyone. Wendy, Jonathan, Coy, and all of our wonderful participants from around the world. Stay safe. Bye-bye.